Hi everybody, this is Joshua Kirk, back with you guys once again on YouTube. And now it's time for episode 3 of Documentary of the Day. And before we get into it, I'd just like to talk about my shirt. I'm wearing a t-shirt for um, uh, a baseball team called the Bowie Bay Sox. Uh, I went to a game a couple of nights ago uh, to get ready for the Orioles season. And, you know, that was fun. And, uh, like, uh, just kind of keeping myself in the baseball spirit right here. Um, but anyway, let's get on to the, the documentary review. Um, so today's uh, review is on um, a documentary that was made in 2000, that uh, is from 2005, um, or at least uh, the DVDs from 2005 or something like that. Um, and it's a documentary on a little community of indie rock musicians that pretty much form a label and sort of an extended like family right there, you know, on this like independent label, you know, business. Uh, so, so the documentary is called Spend an Evening with Saddle Creek. Um, and this was released by Plexa Film, uh, who also did I Am Trying to Break Your Heart by Wilco. Um, but anyway, there's a cover. It's pretty cool. It kind of looks like, kind of reminds me of the cover art for the Bright Eyes album, I'm Wide Awake. It's morning a little bit. It's like really cool. Um, and then it says on there, the first 10 years of Saddle Creek Records. There's a spine and uh, the back of the DVD. And, uh, and it's a film created by Jason... Uh, Cool Bull and Rob Walters, um, and there are a couple of critiques on there. There's one from the New York Times that says, the most vital underground rock scene in the country. By any measure, the bands in the city are in the middle of an extraordinary musical run. And the Boston Globe says, homespun values color this community, and extraordinary ties bind these bands. And the stars, Azure Ray, Bright Eyes, uh, Commander Venus, uh, Cursive, uh, Desaparecidos, uh, The Faint, The Good Life, Lullaby for the Working Class, Mayday, Now It's Overhead, Polecat, Rilo Kiley, Slow Down Virginia, Sun Ambulance, and Sorry About Dresden. And, and some of them are like current bands, and others are like bands that were around for a few years and then broke up. Um, so there are like 11 artists on the label, um, and it's, um, and the documentary is 90 minutes, and the bonus footage is 72 minutes. So there is some little bonus footage on here, uh, along with rare live performances and many more things. But anyway, you know, there, there's the disc right there and then it has an ad for um you know other plexa film documentaries uh and other dvds um and uh like i want to get that uh def cab for cutie documentary that's on there uh, uh drive well sleep carefully And then there's a little guy to play called all the bands that are on the label. And some of them like used to be on Saddle Creek and then like left. Like for example, Rilo Kylie used to be on Saddle Creek, but but then they left. So that's the packaging for Spend an Evening with Saddle Creek. Yeah, it's close. Um, so, like, um, it kind of starts out basically 
talking about basically Rob Mansell and Justin Oberst, like the two members of um, the the two uh, like founders of Saddle Creek. Uh, it kind of starts out them like talking about kind of kind of how it all started. You know, it started under the name Lumberjack Records uh, in 1993. Um, so it kind of started out with just you know some of these people that everybody like knew personally and musically kind of playing in coffee shops specifically like uh, like Kilgore's like uh, it kind of talks about some of Connor Oberst's earliest performances like when he was a like, 12 going on 13 um, teen. Uh, so like he so so like you know Connor Oberst would, would, would play uh, like played at Kilgore's for the first time and he was still kind of a young kid so obviously Ted Stevens had always been a good friend of Connor Roberts so like he like was excited to see a kid actually like completing songs and playing to some people so he so Ted got so excited that he like brought in a four track and recorded him doing like kind of this you know <laughs> unlistenable tape called Unwater uh, called, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, like, uh, and, like, uh, Ted, like, recorded Connor doing this pretty unlistenable tape, uh, called Water. Um, so, so basically the label just started out just something that was just putting out a tape that Connor had made. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, and of course, like, uh, so it kind of started out basically Rob, Justin, uh, Connor, and uh, Ted were kind of the ones involved in it. Um, and like how the label started, just putting out a tape. And then like the next, and then like, you know, the, the next release they had put out was a band that they knew that Ted was in called Polecat. Um, or at least a band that Ted used to be in. Uh, so, so like, you know, it was kind of at first just releasing the Connor Oberst and the Polecat tapes, uh, but, you know, then of course, you know, along came a band called Slow Down Virginia that, you know, Tim Kasher used to have, so, so Tim was involved in a lot of it, uh, and, you know, Cursive is like one of the most beloved bands on Saddle Creek, um, and, uh, like, um, so, so, like, you know, people were just so moved by, uh, by Slow Down Virginia that, like, they, I, I mean, you know, the money was kicking in, like, 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 you know, just, you know, a lot of people just, you know, gave, kept giving Saddle Creek, you know, the, the money to, you know, release, um, uh, slow down CD, um, like, uh, you know, I mean, people were so moved by it that they kept, you know, kind of pushing the label to release, uh, the band CD, uh, so it was kind of the first time, and the, and the members of the label were kind of surprised because they 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 weren't used to like releasing a CD since they just had put out cassette tapes before, but you know of course they they released Slow Down's uh, CD and uh, you know uh, you know Connor's still like a pretty big fan of like you know that album album like no matter how dated it kind of is uh, you know. Connor still, you know, finds it, like, a brilliant album, um, and, uh, like, you know, Connor was kind of in a lot of these bands that started out, too, like, you know, he, he used to have, like, kind of this, you know, like, post-punk band called, uh, Commander Venus, which was quite, you know, um, which was quite impressive for him, because he was still just kind of a young kid getting into high school, you know, kind of playing these songs, and plus, you can tell he was still kind of young uh, when he did like Commander Venus and all this stuff because like his voice sounds a lot different in those recordings than it like did like um like uh, than it does now like on the n most recent Connor Oberst album Upside Down Mountain uh, and um, so um, so obviously it does talk about how you know. Uh, Connor was just kind of doing a lot of things, like, he was pretty focused on Commander Venus for the most part for a while, but, uh, 
but you know, he was doing all this acoustic four track stuff on the side. So he was kind of slowly starting the whole Bright Eyes thing. So he's like doing like acoustic songs and tape. And then also like, you know, playing in kind of a, a loud post punk group uh, for a while. Um, one of the most inventive bands uh, that's talked about pretty frequently on this film is um, uh, the, is, uh, uh, the Faint, uh, a band that, like, you know, The Faint is pretty much the one band on the label that's pretty much open to anything. Uh, when it comes to their music, I mean, they started out kind of this post-punk group with a lot of keyboards, but then, of course, they got so comfortable with all the electronic instruments that they eventually kind of became electronic musicians, almost. Uh, like, uh, especially on their 2001 record, uh, uh, Dance Macabre. Um, right. Um, so, so like, um, you know, The Faint was the kind of band that kind of le led the label to, you know, getting a little more successful and a little more noticed, like, um, uh, well, more noticed uh, to the point where anyone who was coming to the shows was like you know, singing along and you know just having a just having a blast you know um, at, at the shows um, shows um, and uh, like of course you know Todd and of course you know uh, Joel Peterson and Todd Backlay pretty much had a pretty strong connection as friends together so obviously like. Well, well, Todd Backley basically used the skateboard until he, like, he got injured, and, and then, of course, like, uh, you know, Joel just kind of made him play music, you know, uh, so, so they kind of, the faint kind of started out kind of Joel on guitar and Todd on bass, um, and then, of course, they kind of formed into a band, and, like, to the point where, uh, there, there isn't so much guitar in some of the later records the band put out, um, or it's put out, and I think they started under the name Norman Baylor, and like, you know, uh, or, and like, you know, Connor was in their band for, for a little bit when he was young, so like, it was impressive to see that all these people are young, but they have a lot of things going on in their life in terms of, like, music, like, uh, you know, some kids have nothing going on, but, you know, but, but obviously these people, when they were really young, had had a lot of stuff going on, um. going on, um, going on. Uh, but then of course they decided to change their name to the Faint because Norman Baylor just felt kind of meaningless to them. But yeah, it, it totally makes sense to change their name because you know, Norman Baylor doesn't really you know, sound too you know sa satisfying anyway. You know the Faints, however, sounded like a more satisfying and meaningful band name. Um, and, they, and uh, one of the bands that like used to be on the label that Ted used to have is called a uh, Lullaby for the Working Class. Um, and obviously, you know, they were talking about that. That was another band that got pretty noticed and were noticed for how moving and like emotional their music was, and they had and the music had a lot of weirdish instruments in it. There was like banjo mandolin, air organ, glockenspiel, basically a lot of the weirdest instruments are thanks to the the brainchild of a uh, producer that is like Mike Mogus because he like uh, he, he like bought a lot of those instruments uh, and like uh, you know there are a ton of indie rock records that were created at his studio in Omaha called ARC um, and uh, you know uh, Basically, you know, uh, the people kind of talking about, you know, Lullaby were, were like, uh, you know, Mike Mogus is talking about how unique the sound was and talking about how uh, uh, one of the folks at Barn on Records got sent, like, a demo tape of theirs um, and got pretty moved by it uh, and was like, you know, it was like available if they ever wanted to do a record with Bar None or something like that. Um, and like, you know, A.J. A. Mogus, uh, who I guess is probably a brother of Mike Mogus or stuff like that, like, um, obviously, um, 
but it was kind of a, a big part of the project too. So, so yeah, it was really just kind of lots of thinking lyrically and musically too, as like the band used a lot of like thrift shop type instruments, like, uh, but which kind of makes sense because Air Oregon was also a go-to for Neutral Milk Hotel too. Um, so it kind of, the label kind of started out under the name Lumberjack, but then changed to Saddle Creek, especially because people, you know, kept calling the community, like, the Creekers and, like, the, you know, uh, the Creek Kids, and obviously, like, a lot of, you know, and obviously Polecat had, like, a, a track called Saddle Creek, and obviously it became, it seemed to stick so much that obviously, um, it kind of convinced, you know, the the founders of the label to kind of change its name into Saddle Creek because not a lot of people were calling it Lumberjack, you know, everybody was calling it, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Creek Kids and all, you know, so, so, so that's why they eventually changed the name to Saddle Creek because it began to stick. Um, and yes, they do talk about Bright Eyes in here, like some of the earliest uh, demos that were under the moniker Bright Eyes. So Bright Eyes kind of is technically um, a Connor Ober solo project, but then it kind of evolved into a band once Mike Mogus joined in on Letting Off the Happiness, which is one of my favorite Bright Eyes records. Uh, kind of a, a weird album, but like, you know, it's, it's, but it's a good album um, and very emotional for sure. Um, well, for sure. And like, you know, uh, Mike was kind of the one helping Bright Eyes kind of finally help was the thing kind of helping Connor make a sound that he wanted it to be. Because, you know, before this is kind of forgettable, like unlistenable demos that I bet you even he can't really listen to. Uh, he can't listen to. Um, you know, so, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, th letting off the happiness was really when things finally started to work production-wise, you know, because Mike was helping Connor get the sound that he wanted out of it. Um, and, like, using an 8-track instead of a 4-track, which kind of made sense, because besides starting to do 8-track stuff, he, he did do Commander Venus, and he wasn't on 4-track for that. Um, and, and they talked about how you know, uh, Andy LeMaster started to become pretty good friends with both of them, uh, and, uh, like, um, so it kind of made sense they were helping Connor because, like, Mike obviously started from scratch kind of producing records, and Connor was still trying to figure out who to be as an artist, pretty much. Um, just pretty much, um, so, and, and then, you know, they talk about the first Bright Eyes tour, which is basically around apartments and people's houses, like, playing to just ten people, you know, and driving around in, in like, a van, um, around in a van, so, so it kind of, you know, the, the first Bright Eyes tour was kind of like that, um, and then, you know, they, they basically locked, the, and they basically... Connor and the musicians basically locked themselves in, like, you know, Mike's house in, in Omaha um, to record Fevers and Mirrors, uh, which was really the record that really did see Bright Eyes going somewhere in terms of, like, getting more attention and getting you know, magazine articles on the album and, you know, all that stuff. Um, on the album and all that stuff. Um, and they started the tour in, like, uh, you know, small venues, uh, so, so, like, you know, the venues were still small, but getting bigger and more and, and better than, like, all the house parties the band was playing, uh, you know, before, um, and before, um, and, like, uh, you know, so that was kind of the record that kind of changed a lot of, you know, the members of the community's lives, pretty much. Uh, uh, and then they get into a little talk about, you know, uh, Lifted, which is another album by Bright Eyes that 
that I really love. Um, and they talked about how Lifted was the kind of record where they kind of felt like they could do whatever they want with it. Like, Connor had the idea of having five drummers play at once, like a drum corps, uh, which Mike, you know, had never, like, uh, done before. So, like, obviously they kind of tried it out and it seemed to work. And they talked about how it was a more expansive records and record in terms of, like, how many musicians were on it. There were about 40 people that were on Lifted. Um, and so, so obviously it shows footage of basically Clark Backlay, um, uh, uh, Clint, uh, Slint Chase, and, uh, you know, and, uh, like, a lot of people like that, basically, is kind of, they're in there, like, playing, like, different types of drums, like, whether it be a snare, or bass drum, or a cymbal, or whatever, um, and, and, like, I think I even saw, like, one of the drummers, like, using, like, a case of Miller Lite as, uh, percussion or something like that, um, Mm. And and uh, and like um the and then you know you see like a few people like recording a uh, a choir that's at the end of like uh, one of the on like uh, uh one of the tracks off of the album uh Laura Relent which uh, basically like had kind of a, a drunk choir at the end um and they ex you know, like uh. Carter and Mike explained how it was just fun to have like just 40 people just having fun, you know, playing music together in there. And, and plus, like, you know, the, the lyrics on Lifted are definitely very emotional and moving. Um, then they talk about Cursive, which, um, you know, is uh, like, a, or at least the members talk about what Cursive was kind of like. It was kind of a band that was like, you know, like, uh, you know, they, they, they played a ton of shows and wrote a lot of fast songs, but, you know, then of course they broke up for a little bit and then came back together, obviously. But, you know, they, they just kind of got so tired of doing the same thing that they decided to do something a little more unique than that. So obviously, Tim had the idea of having a cello player come in the band, which the people, which the members thought was so weird to have a cello a cellist in a rock band, so, and Greta Cohn pretty much got the call you know, without even expecting it, so, so obviously, you know, she, like, obviously, Tim was trying to work out cello parts, so, like, the Ugly Organ is such a unique record because, like, especially because of the incorporation of cello, which you don't hear in rock music, especially today, like, not even, like, real strings now, um, hmm. Yeah, so like they added a little classical music influence to it, um, influence to it, um, so, so like Cursive's a pretty unique band, um, and, and then it also talks about like, uh, a couple of groups that, you know, Arenda Fink and, Ma and Maria Taylor were in called, uh, Now It's Overhead and, uh, um, and, uh, Azure Ray in which Andy Lamaster was kind of, uh, involved in a lot of the, uh, uh, now it's overhead thing. And, and then some interviews with some members of Rilo Kiley, specifically Jason Bozell, the drummer, and the leader of the group, Jenny Lewis. Um, so, so they obviously talk a little bit, uh, on there. So, um, it's like kind of, uh, this, this community of musicians that, obviously, oh, and there's one point in the documentary where they talk about, like, um, major label offers and how they got so successful that major labels, like, had an idea to try to sign them, but then they were just, like, they didn't want that kind of pressure, so obviously they were happy with just being on Saddle Creek, um, so it talks about, and then at the end it mentions like uh, a little uh, 100 you know K party like a you know that the label had, basically where they had like you know some some you know, gold records and all that stuff, um, and uh, like it, this is a good documentary like um like uh, you know it's a it's a very like good one like sort of 
very honest about like you know the community these musicians are in and it's highly recommended um they, if you like you know bright eyes or the faints or cursive or something like that and want to learn a little more about them check this out so so that's my review on a spend an evening in saddle creek and i'll see you in my next video which uh, will be another album review